I remember getting a call, you're going to the World Cup, by the way, you're going to be number nine. I started getting goosebumps. And then Capello proceeded to play me for three minutes in the last <laughs> one minute. <laughs> what wasn't right in your era? Every single manager I played for I had a problem with it, media. It just felt like it was them against us. It wasn't like we're going to the World Cup together. We were a whisker away, a penalty away from winning it. You know, let's not forget how far we've come under Gareth Southgate. And I think it's far less fractious now. They look like they all get on. We're talking about what we went through. And if you compare this to what we've been witnessing for the last two tournaments we should be sitting in saying thank god for Gareth Southgate and his team what would the message be if you went in there look these are your sons your brothers the kids on your estates who are going there and now they're going to a world cup we know they can win uh, send them players to Qatar knowing that they've got the whole country behind them the fans the media the ex-players if you send them there with that message rest assured that we got a manager who's ticked every box who's had sleepless nights because he's a proud Englishman and that's all we can ask for because when someone does it it's going to be incredible Hey there, it's Jake here. Listen, I want to say a massive thank you to all of our new subscribers, but you know, most people that watch this content on YouTube don't subscribe. I want to change that. The more subscribers, then the more amazing we can make high performance. And I've had a lovely message actually from Rob who says, I only recently discovered the high performance channel and I watched the full Eddie Howe and Tyson Fury interviews, both some of the best content I've seen in the last five years on YouTube. Listen, if you agree and you want to keep this amazing stuff coming for free, then hit subscribe right now. Thank you so much. First of all, welcome to High Performance. We want to have a conversation that the current England team or the current England squad could learn from, from three men who have done so much for their country and represented England with, um, with great credit. When I talk about playing for England, first of all, I'd love to hear from all three of you about the emotion that that brings up. What's the first thing you think about when I talk about your England careers? I don't know. For me personally, I was... I just thought I am one of the best players in the country now because you never really think about that when you're on your way up and you're on the journey to, to get to the pinnacle which was playing for your country I, I was growing up at West Ham at the academy there Joe was just mm. underneath and it's like that's an achievement to get in the West Ham first team and then you're setting new targets and it's always like England's the one though like because at that, cause that point you're not thinking about winning it's just getting into the first team becoming a pro and then if you can get into the England team and set your new goals and achieve that. And when that call comes, or the facts that I got, it was just like, <sighs> first you want to tell your mum. We spoke about this the other day, mm. didn't we? You, you to tell your mum, go home and tell your mates on your estate. And then you, you do settle into your, your bed or your sofa or at some point on that day and go, right, I am actually one of the best in this in the world, in, in this country. Like, Yeah, I, I've got to take, take that on. I remember... South Africa World Cup uh, 2010, I was on the golf course and I remember getting a call from Franco Baldini saying that um, you're going to the World Cup and I've got the call and then he said, by the way, you're going to be number nine, right? So then obviously I straight away, the first person I call is my dad always. I call my dad and I say, dad, I'm going to the World Cup and I'm wearing number nine. And, he got, and then obviously like he put it in perspective for me because I thought, you know, great, man, it's the yeah. World Cup, that was all I thought about. Then he thought actually, he broke it down for me and said, Think about how many boys and girls like play football in England or English who dream of playing for England. Think of how many people make it as a professional footballer. Think of how many people get the chance to play for England. Then think of how many people get the chance to play for England in a World Cup. And then think about how many people want to wear the number nine. Mm. Yeah. And I'm like, on that, on this particular occasion, it was me. <laughs> <laughs> and then like when he broke it down like that, I started getting goosebumps and thinking, yeah. oh my God, like, wait, uh, is it, this is really prestigious. And then Capello proceeded to play me for three minutes and I was one minute. <laughs> <laughs> you must have, knowing you was going up for the next tee shot, you must have been confident. Oh, it was on the England's 18th. number nine. I wasn't answering for the first 18. Obviously, you don't answer your phone, do you? I, on the 18th, I went, this, what is this number? And then I thankfully answered it. <laughs> what, was, what was the next shot like, though? No, no, I was done. I was like, is I was it? coming off the green. Oh, lovely. I answered it, yeah. But, yeah a few beers then straight oh, away. Without, without doubt. <laughs> uh, yeah, similar, like, similar to what the boys said I think playing for England was really important to me because where I like we talked about the other night but where I lived I used to go and watch England I used to get on the tube and go and watch England and the 1990 World Cup was pivotal for me watching Gaza play and do what he did was like right I remember thinking in, in my bedroom watching it like I want to be that I want to be Gaza I want to go to the World Cup and and then so when you get the call to play for England eventually that's all I could think of. I just want to do, if I could just leave something, a little memory, because remember Platt's volley? 
We, yeah. I Belgium, guarantee Belgium. all of us yeah. after that goal went out, we'd have gone out onto the estate and got the lads to throw the ball up and try and do that volley. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And then the fact, the thought of I've got the opportunity to do something He's like that. He's leading us to his volley against just Sweden. Is that where you're going? Is that where you're going? You've just ruined it for me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where it made We've had all these stories you know before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, this could have been in any pub in East London. I'd have just been reeled you all in there. No, but like just being able to pull that shirt on, <laughs> play for England and, and be able to do something like that was amazing Dream. and how soon though does it go from like the pleasure of play being picked for England to then wanting to win for England straight away really you get mm. it's business immediately you, you get there and it's like do you know what I was lucky I, I, I was almost used to being around the England squad because I went as like a 16 year old to the Euros um, Euro 98 in England where it was like a magnificent tournament and they got to the semis and I was there for like probably about 8 or 9 days as a young kid, introducing you to the England setup, but it's a young mm. kid who they think's got potential. So it was like, so when I went there, it was I, I didn't really have that bedding in period where a bit nervous still, but I, I'd been here type of thing. Mm. So I was very much like, okay, I want to get get in the team now. I, I weren't there just happy to be there as a one of the squad players. I was thinking that I, I think I should play. I think I should be in. And it's you you, you look around the dressing room and you're thinking mm. like I, I'd like Gareth Southgate, Tony Adams, Sol Campbell. Martin Keown and people that are in front of me, but I actually thought I should be playing. And it was weird. And I actually ended up coming on my debut for um, Gareth Southgate. He got injured. And um, and it's weird to say, but you're sitting there delighted in a way. Mm. It's bad, but it's, I hope he's all right, but thanks. Mm. And then you go on and you do your mm. thing and you hope they never see that player again. That's interesting because Glenn done that. Glenn Oda would have been manager bringing the young players in and Terry Venables. And then we didn't do that under Sven, did we? We never, no. never saw a young player and then all of our era, and then St. George's Park, when you go up there now, they're all close to it's that. Integrated. They're all integrated. So it immediately takes out that, that sort of, any nerves that these young lads going to play for England would have because they've been around it. They've seen Harry Kane. They've seen Raheem Sterling. They know them. They've had a coffee with them. And, you know, so it's, it, I think it's uh, that's vital for the success going forward. My, my mindset was totally different to these boys, I'll be honest, because uh, Joe and Rio were like 18, 19, I think everyone knew they're going to play for England, you know, like that. It's Steven Gerrard, Wayne Rooney, Michael Owen. You, you, you know that they're on a path to play for mm. England. Like mine was different, you know. I went round about. I wasn't ready for the Premier League till I was 23. Um, you know, I played in it, but I wasn't ready for it. So when I got in the England squad, it was the it was the back end of a season, and it was like uh, the tour of America. A lot of people dropped out, you know. Yeah, but I, I thought did. this is my I chance. Out. <laughs> yeah, well, as you're an experienced international, I was there, crowd. That's yeah, your I was right, there. you know. But there. for me, I thought this is my chance. Mm. There's two games, and my mindset was, I got to play both of them, so I'm not a one cat wonder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was genuinely yeah. because I thought, you know, was that way, was a fear, was it a proper fear? Of course yeah. it was. I don't want to be that one person who gets one cap, you know. Um, and I got injured for the first game, and my debut was in the second game in USA and I, I, I did quite well um, but then obviously my next I got called up to the next one and thankfully you know my England career sort of progressed but I looked at it like Rio's talking about you know with ultra confidence that he should be playing every single game mine was I know I'm not better than Wayne Rooney or Michael Owen I, I'm, conf I'm I'm happy with that but I, my goal was to be the best of the rest mm. you know they both were quite injury prone and I knew that if I was just behind them at everybody so I'm talking you know Jermaine Defoe um Carlton Gold Carl got in there for a food Dean Ashton got in there um Darren Bent so you're yeah. saying you're, you're, these, so you're saying you're better than them I'm saying <laughs> my goal was to be better than you was better than what, you say is what you said what I'm saying is <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure that I'm the I'm the next best mm. basically yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so that was my mindset so what I love about this is that all three of you, when I say the moment you get called up for England, like your eyes mm. light up. I remember having a conversation on uh, on BT with Rio and Frank and Stephen. And I remember Stephen saying something really interesting. He said, he said, playing for England was hard. It wasn't enjoyable. And then I speak to Coutinho, who goes away with Brazil, and they love it. Mm. And we never had that with England. So I think the, the natural progression for this conversation is you go from, oh my goodness, I'm going to play for my country, and you first, at the age of six, kicking a football dream of that moment. Why are you all now sitting here, having had brilliant England careers, but you never lifted a trophy for England? What wasn't right in your era? I think one of the biggest things was the media. We never had a relationship with the media, and that's where you have to say Gareth Southgate's done a, and what a did remarkable that, why, why job. Why was that a problem? Every single manager I played for, 
had a problem with the issues with the, with the media. They were leaking stories about it, certain players who were misbehaving, probably, um, definitely. Um, but also, it just felt like it was them against us. It wasn't like we're going to the World Cup or the Euros together. Whereas the last couple of tournaments, it's felt like the media have gone and said, you know what, we're in this together, guys. And he, he's created that. Gareth Southgate and that squad have created that. And talking to Stevie, I, I remember we come on a coach after a game away somewhere and we played and we didn't play particularly well, none of us. And we're sitting there, I think we, I don't know if we got beat or whatever, but he come on the bus and I remember him getting up, putting his bag down, sitting down and went, that'll probably be out of four in the paper tomorrow. Like, but that, that type of comment was like, that's one of the first things on your mind as an England player then. It's not conducive to a good working environment <laughs> to be the best, to be elite, to be a winning team because you're worried about the reaction of the media who are so powerful at that time, especially in our country. Bearing in mind, there was no social media then. So w what they said was the gospel. It wasn't like you can say stuff now in the media and these mm. papers can write stuff or people can say stuff. Pundits like ourselves can speak. Players have a voice now and a platform to go, no, that ain't right. Or I don't agree with that. So, and I don't know, we, we weren't good enough really, was we? Yeah, I do think there's an element of it was uh, the, the, the competitiveness of the Premier League. Mm -hmm. I think if I look at like Rio, Bex, Gary Neville, Skulls, you know, you've got you know, JT, Lamps, Joe, Stevie, Cara, like that, at that Premier League at that time was war. It was, it was, mm -hmm. it was two, like four or five really, really good teams. And at the core of that was, were, were English players. And I, and I feel that, that it was detrimental to the, to the England team, how competitive the Premier League was, and how much you wanted to get one over on. on did those you? Did you? Teams. I, I, I felt that, but I've never heard it from someone. Did you feel that when you was in the squad? Yeah, yeah, I think you could see it. Like for me, I was quite new to it, and um, I think certainly the Manchester Liverpool thing is a thing, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Having played for as soon Liverpool, as you signed there, you was an enemy. You were exactly right. So Alex Ferguson would that would, would put that in your head. Mm. The same as you know anyone from Liverpool, you know, and even the regional thing. No matter about the the the. the team the teams and how successful they are but as places you know mm. it's just the thing and i think it's less far less fractured just now you know that they look like they all get on they all look mm. like they're not at war every saturday mm. you know remember those games that we played in the champions yeah. league those that was all out like Intent, you know, intense like, mentally games. exhausting intense yeah. and the two managers were you know were rivals yeah. everyone was rivals yeah. and then you meet up for england like yeah. how are you gonna leave that at the yeah. door mm. and then be a team yeah, to be fair, like I, I, I listen to what the boys say, but I, I think it's more from a pragmatic. I just think tactically we we we'd fallen behind, you know. And, I, and you have to remember, Glenn, you know, then then Kevin Keegan come in and he didn't, he went a bit old school, Kevin. And then we went on to Sven. Sven was doing the stuff four four two rigid, rigid stuff that I was doing at fourteen. At fourteen, I had a I had a said this ain't right, you know. And what I watch. Italian football, you know, when they're, they're playing in triangles, they're playing out from the back, players are taking responsibility. And we'd go, I'd go away with England from the age of under 15s, uh, right the way through every level, and we wouldn't have control of the games, but I know we'd have better players, technically, physically, like mentally. Like the, all of the England team, all them names you listed Rio, John, Frank, Stevie, Rooney. Elite players, no doubt. I've played with the best players in the world. We all have like been fortunate enough to do that. And they're as good as them, you know. But tactically, I just think it was a case where we was going the wrong way down a road of how we believe football should be played so far. And we'd all been brought up in that sort of system. So when it comes to international football, it was we wasn't set up to win international football. We could win a game off of brilliance of a, of an England player. You know, mm. whether it be a, a Beckham free kick, Stevie scoring a wonder goal, whatever. But I just think the system in place was fragile. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't. Yeah. We never really, I, I, if, if mm. I asked you, did, did you ever play in an easy England game where you come off mm. and you went, that was like no. the easiest game, like you didn't even mm. get a sweat on? Mm. Well, for our clubs, you could name loads of games. You probably forgot more than yeah. you'd remember how many easy games you had. Mm. With England, it was never easy. I always used to think this is graft. Go to like Mold Moldova and come mm. off sweating, thinking, "Jesus, we oh, got through that one." Why? Because tactically, we were we were we were so poor. Like we were so rigid. I remember what Capello's, was our patterns of play? 
do you remember? Do you, uh, no, no one ever there sat down no and gone. Play. Mm. Right, when you get the ball, you need to have this, this, this option. When the goalie gets the ball, you need to be here. When Rio gets the ball, you can be here or here. And, and you know, like you see with players now, there's clear patterns. The structure it's like teams. standard for even the poor teams. You can see what they're trying to do. With us, I don't know what we were trying we to do. We relied on individuals. You look at mm. the big games we won. Like Crouchy scored the goals in the, in the, in the, uh, the World Cup. It's like individual brilliance, mm. isn't it? It's, it's just because Crouchy's there and knows where to be instinctively. It ain't like, oh, we've, we've worked to get in that position to then play. Mm. It was just like, get it there and then someone will be there to finish it off. Mm. Michael Owen in the World Cup. Did you ever feel you could go and challenge tactics or discuss them in more detail with the coaches? No, no, well, F F Fabio Capello, no. Mm. I remember he screamed at Theo Walcott that first session. Do you remember? Mm. Theo Walcott turned like a ghost <laughs> when I recovered. Because he said before the session, he's like, he played right wing. He said, I don't want you to run inside. We was in Australia, Austria mm. before South Africa. Mm. He said, I don't want my wingers to come inside. Stay wide, stay wide. He really went on about mm. it. John, that point home and the first whistle, the first play of the game, <laughs> Theo's run inside and he stopped the session, screamed, going nuts. Mm. And I remember Theo getting on the coach after going, oh, wow, yeah, <sighs> so scared. Like. What does that do then to the rest of the players who who are established internationals who yeah. should be able to share their yeah, thoughts or their views. Culture weren't like that. No, nah, yeah, nah, we wasn't... Yeah. Like, again, we, 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 the boys are right in the sense there was a disjointedness between Liverpool, Manchester United and Chelsea players and Crouchy's right. There was massive rivalries that don't exist now. That was, But I really think it was the tactical side of things. And if you go on to Capello, who, by the way, has been a genius and what a career he's had. Mm. You know, you can't disregard what he's done. But my problem with Capello from, from and when I was fit largely, because that was sort of to start of my England, end of my England career, but start of my injury problems. When I was fit, he played me, apart from at, apart from at the World Cup, like went to 2010. So, but the way that he didn't live in England, I thought, which if you're an England manager, you've got to be, you got to lead like Gareth does. He, he, you know, he's a he's a he's more he's a figure, isn't he? He talks well. He, he he's part of St George's Park. He he, you know, like I said, I just think there wasn't no care and attention. He, he it turned up when it was close to an England game, and then what done me was at the World Cup when they was all watching Italy, like hollering and hooting when they scored. Like I just think that the foresight of of that wasn't great. It, it was not good optics. For like, it bothered you. It bothered me yeah. as an Englishman, you know. And I just think there's there's a reason why it must have bothered some people above. Because since then we've not gone for a, a foreign manager. I firmly believe, that, especially now in the current climate where you could have the ability to develop coaches, there was a scarcity of good managers and coaches to take the job when Fabio and Sven got the job. That we didn't have enough. But nowadays there's no excuse to not produce managers and coaches to come like Gareth Southgate. The next run of them will be Potter. Eddie Howe, Frank, Stevie, Scotty Parker. If you, you know, look at them now, though, you you obviously do a bit of coaching and stuff. Yeah. But you see the coaches on what, the way they coach now, and you go to watch any kind of academy games. The football is replicating what you're seeing in the Premier League with yeah. Man City type football and, and what Potter's produced at Brighton, etc. It's yeah. all fluid through the lines, playing through. The, it's there's no long ball game really now. But you can see how much they've worked on that in, yeah. in training. Yeah. And I know, look, like it's slightly different different when you've got. Um, a group for maybe a week or 10 days. It's not, you can't work on it every single day, but I don't remember working on, on much. Do you? But, but set pieces. Set pieces and, and defending. But uh, if you if you took England, if you, if you can get back in time machine and take an England team from 2002 and think you've got all these great players, you think, and what's been the problem handling the ball in tournaments at important times? So you, you ain't got to tell Rio Ferdinand, John Terry... How to defend Ashley Cole, Gary Neville, like they, they they can play in the back four. So I think the time would have been better off used to implementing patterns of play, how to hold mm. on to the ball, C encouraging players. I and I think we're still not good at this, where we don't get the the technical players. We've still to this day, and I love Gareth and what he's done is amazing and and everything. But the technical players who can handle the ball, like there's still a mistrust that comes from historically, mm. like. You know, we talk players like Madison, Grealish, Mount, Foden. You know, you did, they can't all play, but at least two of them should be on the pitch at all times for England, possibly three. Uh, handling the ball. I think this thing, that, that's a good point in terms of handling the ball. But it's also, 
our generation for definite was never brought up and this generation's a bit better but still nowhere near what Spain and Italy and France are like we were ne- always taught do not pass the ball to a man with someone marking him mm. well if you're going to if you're going to win you need to pass the ball to people that are marked to be able to take that man mm. out of the game sometimes do you know what I mean and if you have got someone under a bit of pressure give it to him be confident to give it to him whereas mm. that's where you end up going away from what your principles are and your values are as a team because you're not confident and you, you remember you're not you're told don't give it to him it's risk to pass it into someone mm. who's marked and so I think there's a lot of things reasons why we didn't win I think definitely I agree with the guys I think that the, the, the tacticals of our team and the generation was was bad for the players we had um, but I do feel that the environment wasn't the right environment to create a winning team so can I ask you around that then because when we interviewed Gareth he spoke to us around he tried to break down this club versus country and make Mm. it club and country and one of the ways he'd done it was by getting players to tell a little bit of their own story so you can Mm. see more what you have in common rather than what divides you like club Mm. loyalties so was anything ever done like that in terms of breaking down barriers or have you know you're in hotels where you've got all this time was anything ever done where people can tell a little bit of their background? A few drinks in the bar after games. Mm. That was it. And that that was, to be fair, that was the tool used mainly to, you know, break down barriers, social lubricant, have a little drink. It was good though, wasn't it? It was good. <laughs> <laughs> but there was nothing done like, like I said, that that is Gareth Southgate, a proud Englishman who clearly loves the job, who's not leaving a stone unturned in doing everything to try and change the culture of what's gone on before and trying to improve on on what's needed. and these little details they can help. Yeah, but I I also think it's the to, I think the England national team has benefited from um a, I don't want to say less competitive Premier League but a less aggressive Premier League yeah. if you mm. like I I think we all remember you know Roy Keane in the tunnel you mm. know like would that happen now. Mm. You know, little mm. things like that. I'm talking about like horrific like, tackles flying in. You know, we almost had a fight. I don't, I don't yeah, remember. We've, we've had Anfield. fights. You know, we, we, we were mates with England, but we were, you know, things would go on on the who, pitch. Who, and I'd, I'd win that fight. I don't. Well, Rio would, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I just feel like it's, I definitely think that the Premier League is a different place now than what it was. Yeah. I don't think we can, I think we can all agree on that. It's yeah. not, you know, I think it's an amazing product. It's a beautiful, we all love watching it, but it's not what it was. In those days, it doesn't have the subplots that it was in our time. <clears throat> you knew that you was—I don't know—that so and so's playing so and so. There would be some sort of subplot, whether it's the two managers at yeah. it, or there'll be a player you know doesn't like that player, and there'll be like an aggressive a spark that could just change the whole dynamics yeah, yeah. of the game. Mm. It doesn't really seem like, and I think the reason why that isn't the same now is because one, the personalities and characters are different, and their upbringings have been different, but also with social media, you're now. You're now, without ever meeting someone, you're a mate. Mm. So all of these players like each other's pictures, which is, is the culture today. They like each other's pictures and chat on, on, on Instagram, never met each other. So when they do see each other in England, it's like, what's happening? You're out here. Because they've got a common place where they've been connecting. Whereas if I, I, I didn't see Crouchy home and away yeah. in the games, and then I'd see him in England, I wouldn't chat to him ever again no. really I might see him on a night out but he wouldn't remember he'd be too drunk but why did, <laughs> <laughs> why did none of you and you know there were other big leaders in the England team at mm. the time why did nobody see this and change this well, well, well why did you not see so that you weren't so, get, you right, weren't go, close or tight like go back to your smart people 2010 and you know we talk about why didn't anyone go to the manager JT would try was, was try, tried to speak to the manager and he, he was the captain along with Rio at that time I can't remember but like the big players and he just got absolute shut down right so a JT then come out and was and he did an interview before one of the World Cups and he was like well you know I can't even remember the, 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 he was like we're going to have a chat with the manager about something in the meeting the press must have asked the question the results were bad and then and then we had this meeting arranged with Capello where it was going to be the players. Do you remember? Do you remember? And the players and the manager. And we was going to have a conversation about what we can do. And we turned up and then he just went, go to dinner. And that was it. And I'm like, probably could have been handled a bit better in terms of, I'm not, in terms of how you ask about it. But if you, we could have had a really forthright conversation just before a World Cup. And we could have got aired things, you know. There were I think the culture was different, though. The culture was different because that's like it was almost like these managers then probably saw it more like you're questioning my my uh, 
the way I rule this Other nations an were able to win tournaments and competitions. Like they mm. were doing something that mm. England weren't. Like it, it was chalk and cheese, wasn't it? We had Sven, which was just so relaxed, and then mm. and then yeah. we were get it was getting labelled like player power. Players are running the show, yeah. you know, and and so they went so far the other way. So you weren't allowed to speak to Fabio Capello because he he ruled it with an iron fist. It was like we, it was like we had this that didn't work, so we're going to have this now, and we were just told this is how we do it until things started going badly at a World Cup and all the, you know, kind of things that were banned or stopped were, were, were allowed to, we, he tried to relax us because he realised he, he sort of panicked during mid-tournament that we weren't performing. Sven, and Sven was bringing sh like shirts to get signed by Bex though, wasn't he, remember? <laughs> <laughs> he was England like, manager, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Getting shirts, like Bex to sign mm. shirts, like I was almost like- and What was your perception of that when you're seeing a manager do that? I just turned away in disgust. I was like, whoa. Like, because mm. the England manager's like, he's the he's the man, isn't it? He's like, your manager is like, you look at him as if he's, mm. he's the rules of roost. He directs where we're going. He's like, looks at no man in this team with like admiration or would show that, oh, bit of a star, bit of an icon there. It just mm. felt like that was the, I was like, wow. It was just, it was mad as well. It's, it is weird this, but Bex is an absolute superstar. And we're all happy and that's fine. That's not a problem. But it's mad. We used to laugh at it as a team because I remember we got off the coach once and Bex got off the coach and all of our security just went with Bex. And the whole team is standing there and, like that, and there's like fans coming from all over the gaff. And they're going, like, we're all getting marauded by all these fans. Pictures here, there. Yeah. And you look around and Bex is just... It wasn't his fault. <laughs> just yeah. the security was like, he's the, he's the superstar. Got to look yeah. But like, it was... It, isn't it for me? I didn't give a, a, a hell about anything like that. They weren't, don't bother me. But when you look at it afterwards with hindsight, and you think, okay, there must have been some people but subconsciously, together, right? In the same yeah, hotel, but subconsciously, so some people might go, flipping no. Yeah, I was one more for him, one for us. Mm. It's like, and then it just that, that, that's just a little tweak in the ambience then and the environment and the culture that it changes. It could be a problem for mm. as, and uh, contribute to why you didn't become successful not the, mm. the be all and end all but if you know what I mean so that World Cup in 2010 that you're describing it like if you take Spain as an example mm. at the time when Mourinho and Barcelona Mourinho's Madrid and Barcelona yeah. were at loggerheads and there's that story that um, the, the goalkeeper Casillas and Xavi had just connected on a private phone call because mm. they'd gone back through the youth ranks and they yeah. agreed to stop the enmity to bring the squad mm. together for the World Cup yeah. Did any of the players ever get together privately? If you've not got the manager that's encouraging it, did any of you reach out and try and build I, these bonds? I didn't, but like I said, I, I could, I could sense now looking back that the things, but because of my character, I didn't. I was always a bit of a floater anyway. I could go and mix, mingle with anyone. Like I knew Rio very well. I knew Michael Carrick. Very, he was my roommate for four years at West Ham. So um, yeah, so I, and I didn't feel like I wasn't like one of the main. I wasn't the, in the leadership group, like one of the main people. So I wasn't really, I'm going to go, if I just started a group chat, go like, right, let's, <laughs> let's, 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 let's go, what's Carly doing? <laughs> Come on, mate. <laughs> oh, I feel like I'm in that boat as well. <laughs> <laughs> they had to laugh me out of the room. Uh, but I just, I, yeah, I went along with whatever I went Can't to. We I just was just asking to be there. <laughs> Can't we just get along? Maybe you just thought this was what playing for England was like. Yeah. Like, almost every former England yeah. player that I now work with yeah. on the telly, says, oh, playing for England was like scary. I was rigid. I was tight. I was anxious about the reaction yeah. of the media. That, like, that's, I was that's never true. free. Is that true? I think so. For me, it was, yeah, it was until I started scoring. Like, I always felt like I had to prove, I, I, had, to, every, I had to score in every game just to stay in there yeah. because I didn't fit the profile of an England player. I didn't look like an England player. You know, I was different to everything else. So I uh, I felt like, yeah, and I felt there was, I, you could feel it. Even when, I remember mm. starting the first game of the World Cup, like 2006 mm. and in the dressing room before Around, like players were doing things that they'd never done before you know like I did I definitely felt that there was yeah. a there was a nervous sort of thing I, I just like that. you just notice things around like and I'm talking smallest details like Rio was saying like the smallest little things you think we'd have a huddle right before yeah. we went out never done that before yeah like, why, I know it's a big game but like we've never done that before so mm. why are we doing that now just sm tiny little things everyone's looking at each other like that. yeah it was like <laughs> why are we in a huddle like just little things like that like before you go out and play Paraguay in the, in the opening game yeah. and like you just think that's that's nervousness you know like, and I, I don't know it's just it breeds you know, and, and you can feel it And but it shows you there was no real leadership yeah. from the top from the manager then because I think the managers drive it I think all the clubs that I've played at 
the manager drove the way the team carried himself and there was a reflection of the manager and the England team we didn't even have real a real identity under Sven and and under Capello it was it was, it was just or well, identity was was all the wrong re, like wrong identity type of things I said it right well your identity was all wrong because of the person who was in charge and you reflected that person well, with, with Sven we were quite a nervous team at times do you know what I mean we were we were uh, we were placid in everything we'd done passive in the way that we played we just relied on the individuals to come in and produce a mm. performance or a moment we got to the World Cup because of Bex against Greece if Bex doesn't play we don't go it's just an individual's performance who got us there it's crazy but that's just how, that's how we were so it shows you that the functionality of the whole team was wrong so if you look back now then what do sorry, you think sorry and just to go back oh, to the sorry. point about Xavi and, and um can see us. I respect that because that's a maturity to address, see it and then address it. I think we were too club dominant. We, it's like almost thinking we're going to go back to our clubs. What's the gaffer going to say? What's the fans going to say? Because they didn't, our, our fans didn't, they did, they'd, they'd, they'd say bomb the England team and come play for United. That's the way it was back then. That's what Alex Ferguson encouraged as well, yeah, right? Yeah. So the same as, as of most of the club managers, I think. Yeah. They don't care about your national oh. team, do they? There's yeah. no, absolutely no care given yeah. at all it, towards it, that. In the same sense, though, th the Spanish were ahead of their time tactically mm. as well. So even like they they won the World Cup probably despite of the, in spite of the fact that they probably weren't. And also, Xavi and Casillas' maturity coming together. So they had the tactical nous. They had the quality players and then they had the togetherness and that's why they won three tournaments. So it's like, we're, we're trying to dis we're trying to find the, the reason why England didn't win. And there's probably multiple reasons. And we always have to say, there maybe, maybe we wasn't good enough yeah, as well, yeah. individually. Look, look at some of the teams there. Do you know John, what I mean? At that yeah. time, Brazil, Brazil. You know, like our, yeah. some of the teams there, France, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we Spain, have, we have Germany. To, yeah, we have to yeah, be... Proper teams. But like, it's hard for the ego. And we might say, well, maybe we just wasn't good enough as well. So all of these things we discussed uh, have all probably played a small part of it. So Gareth Southgate's job is to make sure, he can't do nothing about the quality of players. I think we've got the quality of players, but he can put the system in place, the tactical system. He can get the environment right and he can set the culture right so that when they, like, like he has done, when he's had difficult moments at tournaments, they can come through their moments. Whereas we, when we had a difficult moment at a tournament, someone got sent off doing something rash or a team just broke us down and we lost our you know, composure because you need to have everything to- Name names. Time. No. <laughs> no, but you know the England team now, uh, I think they're hamstrung by the way that Gareth sets them up is because of his fear of what could happen to the defenders. I don't think he trusts the defenders enough defensively to be able to go right, go and play. Yeah, I think he, he's he's playing like that with with the reins are still on a lot of the players. Mm -hmm. When you look look at our, our attacking players that we've got in any generation, they're top players. And you look at other teams; would they be fearful of those players if they were let off the leash? Yes, they would. I think, but because of the fragility at the back, I think that there there, there means that there's a, a cautiousness to the way that Gareth is setting mm. our team the, up. The best teams we see at the moment, like leave two v two, two v two. Mm. You know, yeah. we we let's be honest, we, we couldn't can't. we couldn't do no. that. No, and then you're going to this tournament now. Carl Walker injured, Maguire's injured at the moment or, mm. and out of form. John Stone's injured. They're the first three that you was going to pick probably Gareth mm. Southgate mm. for this World Cup. He hasn't got them. He's uh, to uh, to put out there. So where does we go now? Where do we go? Well, I was going to ask you to pick up on that point you made, Joe, around you need things to go perfectly, mm. and yet mm. you know it never does. Mm. So how much planning was ever done on? things going wrong, people getting sent off, divisions in a camp, media stuff. How much was that ever discussed? Nothing. Not that I can remember. It's mental as it so sounds like. People will be at home going, what? Like, but it is, that was literally was, we, we knew the system we was going to play. You knew who was going to play. You more or less knew what, the, you know, and we were going to do the same thing for all different stages of the games. And that was it. That's our fault. That's why I say tactically. Because mm, we I'm never like, changed to suit to an opponent ever. I'm like, are we, like you could have done saying a qualifier when we played one of them games. If we like Rio said, we could have played Moldova or Macedonia, and we won the game. Say we won the game three one, and if you'd have actually like, pulled pulled the game apart and gone, hold on a minute, we had 
we could have had so much more possession if we'd have had a Michael Carrick in there yeah. and it would, Extra it would have, body. we'd have allowed Rio Ferdinand to drop into the midfield and then come back. Why don't we work on that for the next camp, the next game when we're playing a uh, San Marino at home? We're going to win the game because we can play with nine men and win the game. But if we can just get that part, we we work for three days on getting that part of the team right. Bang, right, okay, we'll win the game. And there was an improvement in that, how we was getting out. You know, and then we'll take that into the next game. And then we'll go, right, there's the middle phase of the pitch. Right, we, we've got Steven Gerrard. We've got, what is their, uh, what, and Frank Lambert, Owen Hargreaves. You know, we've got, what are their qualities? What can they bring? Let's try and get the best. Let's find a system to play. But it was none of that. And that's why, I hear, the, I hear what the lads are saying about the, the, the you know, that could have been solved easily. But, but that, goes, the base. that goes to the point as well. You only enjoy being somewhere with football if you're winning mm. or if you're playing well at least minimum. Do you know what I mean? You, you could be going where it's the best atmosphere that Gareth Southgate uh, put, put together. The ambience, the environment's perfect. Mm. The culture's great, but they're getting beat every game mm. and they don't look like they're ever going to win a game and the, the football's rubbish. No one player will come out of there going, it's a great Great squad though, love mm. being here. They'd all hate it. Mm. So did you got to get the balance. enjoy playing for England? Yeah, I did. I, I did. I did. I, 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 I did. But I loved it. I think like whenever I played, like I say, I was I knew I was sort of like a plan B at yeah. times. But, but you can still be proud, but like actually well, enjoy. No, I, I like, enjoyed it. I didn't. I, yeah, no, I, I, didn't. I, I did. I, I was unbelievably proud, and the pride that I took walking out, and again, like I say, knowing you're one of the best in your country. Mm. Um, never left me every time mm. I stepped out for England every time I got called up there was a buzz yeah. but I never enjoyed the games I enjoyed training I, I, like, I like training and stuff I love training every day but I'd never come out of a squad and go I absolutely love that camp mm. because there was things that weren't, weren't good about the camp and there was the game where I, like I say we never had a game where I went you know what oh, we are uh, we're, we're a problem for everyone Play anyone, we could beat anyone. Didn't feel like that. Yeah. yeah. No, for, for me, I was just selfish in, in, in many ways. I just, <laughs> because I just thought I'm playing for England, right? And I just felt I'm playing with all these great players. And every time I pulled on an English shirt, I felt I was going to score. I felt like I was invincible playing. They couldn't for defend you, country, like, could honestly, they? Honestly, yeah. international football and Champions League football, I'd prefer to play that than I'd play in the Premier League. Yeah. Like, I just felt that me they too. couldn't handle me. And I felt like I really? was, I'd just go into mm. games knowing I was going to score. I was like, on the right. I've got Joe Cole on the left. I've got Stevie behind me, Frank behind me. You know, I felt invincible, literally. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm talking purely from a selfish yeah. point of view. Like, I'm not looking at the bigger picture. I'm thinking about me scoring, playing for England. And every time I went to an England game, I felt like it, I was What, what, what um, defenders did you play against? Do you thought, wow, these are like superstar defenders who I thought are top, top players that you went and played at international or Champions League level and thought, hold on a minute, I've just torn you apart. Mate, honestly, like... It sounds stupid, but I don't even know if I should go, say go, it. Go, go, go. I, I, know, I know the answer. I know the answer. That's why I've asked it. No. <laughs> Do you know, I said this on the, I said this the other day. I'd prefer to play against Nesta, right, yeah. than Gary Cale. No, right, know. which is, which is, in, but for my qualities, you know, and what my qualities are, I, I feel like I could, I could, I could, I could, I would dominate him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that yeah. sounds ridiculous. I, I know it does, but yeah. I'd get joy against him. Fabulous defender, but um, I just felt like for my qualities, they hadn't, they never saw anything like me <laughs> <laughs> in Europe, you know, and, and and that's I used that to my advantage. Yeah, yeah. There's something really interesting I think that's come out of this conversation, which is that you know Peter felt almost lucky, right, to be playing for England, mm. and you've been very honest about that. Whereas you know you've got like a. Rolls Royce footballer, which what you were referred to as, who almost expected to play for England because you were at the absolute top of your game. Yet for Peter, there was freedom playing for England. For you, there was restriction playing for England. And I think that comes mm. down to expectations. So mm. I would love to know from the three of you what this tag of golden generation did or didn't do for all of you. Um, now, going back to like, just to answer your question previously, did I enjoy? I love playing for England, but throughout my career, it, I was always, for some reason, it was people would. I always felt pressure going onto the pitch, whether it be for West Ham, Chelsea, because for some reason people always wanted to talk about what I couldn't do yeah. rather than what I could do. So playing for England was not a problem pressure wise. I played for that on my back the whole time. That was the era that I felt right away. I, I got maybe the first year in my career at seventeen out of the way where everyone was patting me on the back. Then after that, it was more along them lines what. I couldn't do so playing for England 
I never felt the pressure, but I could see it in other players a little bit more. Like I wasn't, I didn't care whether I got a four or a five or a six. Genuinely, like, do you know what I mean? So I think that's what helped me. But the golden generation, the burden was probably on Rio Moore, John, Frank Steve. I don't think, I think I was on the cusp of that. I played 56 times, but if I went and done something, scored a goal or, or made a goal and assisted it, it was everyone pat me on the back, but it wasn't expected of me. Wayne Rooney, the the, the mm. spine of the team, bore the brunt of that. Mm. You know, but it, it, In the Premier League, these boys were... were it was super hum human levels, you know. It was yeah. like Rio and JT, like Lamps and Stevie, mm. uh, Rooney, Owen. Mm. You know, what they did, that spine in the, in the Premier League was so unbelievable that everyone just assumed that that would happen for England mm. and they'd all be the same at, and doing yeah. it. And, 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 and that's hard, it was hard to replicate. Yeah. I grew up watching John Barnes and Chris Waddle for England, two of the best, most talented players of their generation, booed for England. Yeah. yeah. Told they shouldn't be playing. So when I got into the England team and we were labelled the golden generation, it wasn't our fault. It just was in that it was labelled. We labelled it. It was almost like, well, I've seen this before. I've heard this before. I've seen big talents before me, better players than me, mm. booed and, and told they shouldn't play for England. So I can't moan about it. And but I didn't find it a huge burden. It was just main, mainly in press conferences when people would talk about it. It would come up. I'd never thought about it outside of that. Um, but. I think some people dealt with it different. Some people felt that pressure a bit more. Um, probably more attacking players as well because there's an expectancy. You've got to go and produce something. Mm -hmm. A lot of defenders are reacting to people's movements and, and strikers, whereas as a, an attacking player, you've got to go out there and score. And if you don't, you're meant to be the golden generation. So um, it's difficult for them, I'm sure, more than myself. So knowing everything you know, um, having pulled on the shirt for your country so many times, as we approach another World Cup, what is the message you would like to put out there, not just to the England manager and his staff and the players, but also to the public and also to the media about what needs to be done to release the shackles, to release the pressure, to allow expression and freedom at an international level? Because I think until we can get to that point, then it's always going to be hard for the players. I think they're doing it. I, I think they're doing it fantastically well. I think we're so quick to criticise this England team that have got to a semi-final, to to, to a final um, of major tournaments. Well, maybe that's what we should stop doing then. I yeah. think we should celebrate them. I really mm. do. I, I feel like there is, um, you know, a lot of stick for a manager that has done incredibly well. Like something mm. that we couldn't achieve. We couldn't. We couldn't get to a final. Um, and yeah, I, th I think there are certain things that we're going to criticise, but he's England manager. That's always going to be the case. Mm. I think um, they've if, some of the pressure situations. You, see, you know, Harry Kane's penalties, or mm. um, you know, they might just defending or getting into that situation where they they, they they get across the line in the final. We were a whisker away, a penalty away mm. from winning it. Mm. You know, let's not forget where we've come you know how, how far we've come under Gareth Southgate and I think it's, it's easy yeah we've lost a few games now and we're, we're so quick to, to criticise but I think we've got fantastic and that also goes back to the FA like how, how they've started developing players like mm. our, some of our young players now are the hottest talent Hugh around Bellingham. you know yeah, like yeah. But German teams by I Munich, mean, they're sniffing around our young players at under 17 level under 16 mm. level under 21 level and under 18 level like, we've come a long way mm. you know we used to, Spain, we looked at Spain's model. We were like, mm. you know, this is the players we want to produce. We're producing naturally gifted footballers now. And I think, you know, we should celebrate that. I think mean, there, there's probably as many, if not more scouts at England games in the youth system than like places like Germany, yeah. France, Spain now. And that tells you the development of, the, of, our, of our youth system has been nothing short of magnificent. So I agree with Crouchy wholeheartedly. You've got to celebrate that. And what Gareth Southgate has created there has been nothing short of phenomenal. It's, it's, it's compared to what we're talking about, what we went through. And if you compare this to what we've been witnessing for the last two tournaments, we should be sitting here and saying, thank God for Gareth Southgate and his mm. team. We can all sit here and, and, and pick apart his tactics and say that he, Joe don't agree with this, I don't agree with that, Crash, you don't agree with this. That's fine, that's part of football. I think Gareth Southgate would allow that and say, you know what, that's, that's, that's part of the course. But to sit here and say we should get rid of him, after what he's done, I think it's, it's like it's absolutely and crazy. And the players yeah. will see that, by the way. Yeah, yeah. and I think they, that that then filters to the yeah. players, and then the nervousness from maybe from the manager that yeah. might be subconscious, they then yeah. feel that, and then that affects the squad. So, as media, as fans, support them for yeah. for remember the feeling that we had in around the, the, the stadiums when we was all going to the games in the Euros. Remember mm. the feeling around the country, what that mm. done 
people for going off school. School mm. businesses closing for their moments. Mm. Like that's because of that, what that team done. We quickly forget too, too far yeah. too often. Yeah, it's, 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 it's that's yeah, well said. I just think we need to remember what these boys have done. We need to remember that, and and also I think it's a bit like when you play poker and you you know you push your hands in, and there's nothing you can do. We're 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 to, we're here now. We haven't had a good run in. We got Gareth Southgate's done a great job. And we're in. So if, if my message to the fans, the media, anyone who's got anything of a connection with England is look, these are your sons, your brothers, the kids on your estates who are going there. They've come through all of the adversity to become England players. They put a body of work together and now they're going to a World Cup, which we gen- which really we know they can win. We know they got a chance, right? So you just need to put everything aside. Like I said, we'll all sit there and have a different system and a different way of playing to Gareth Southgate. It's irrelevant. Gareth's the manager. Now let's all get behind him. All them players, send them players to Qatar knowing that they've got, you know, the whole country behind them, the fans, the media, the ex-players, you know. We all, you know, if you send them there with that message... And there's going to be difficult moments. We're not going to go and win a tournament and they're not going to be a hairy moment. We might have to come through some adversity. Someone might get sent off. It might be a penalty shootout. You know, but rest assured that we've got a manager who's ticked every box, who's had sleepless nights because he's a proud Englishman and he's done everything he can within his power. And all the people at St George's Park and the FA and whoever has coached these kids right through, they've all done the, what, the best they've can and that's all we can ask for and go there and support them and, and, and enjoy it because one, when someone does it, it's going to be incredible. So Gareth told us that one of the things that he's started doing is bringing former players back mm. in to present shirts to the squad the night before games. Mm. If you were invited back in and I've you I've done could, it. And if you could, well, what was the one message then that you'd I deliver to the I squad? I absolutely melted. I don't get nervous, like, you know, but I had to go in, I was working doing the game and Gareth said would you give the shirt to um, Callum hudson and another lad who'd made their debut just before the kickoff, like an hour and a half before the kickoff. and I've not been in an England dressing room for like a good seven, eight years but in my head I'm thinking that's, that's a breeze like you know just that they're, my co- they're my peers my colleagues play football with them they're only footballers I've got in there the legs started shaking <laughs> I started stuttering um and I was like, I went. I was like, I absolutely, I just, the lads must have been looking at me thinking, who is this geezer? Stuttering, like, stuttering. I was all over Shows the what gap. England does to you even but today. Like, yeah. But then again, and I'm not, all I've got to say is, yeah, well done boys. You you know, and that's it. But I went and uh, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll have to redeem myself. If there's someone needs a shirt, I'll have to come up with some. <laughs> well, I like Damien's question. If you were able to give one message to those <laughs> lads, what would, what would the message be if you went in there? No fear. Don't have any fear. Like shackles off. One opportunity to go to this World Cup and win it. Go out there and just do your thing. No, I, I would go. Oh, my message to the team would be: we're gonna. There's gonna be lots of trials and tribulations in this tournament. We don't know what what we're gonna face. You know, we're prepared for everything, but go out there. And the one thing when when we get on that plane to leave Qatar with the trophy or without a trophy, you make sure that you have no regrets. You you live it from now until then. So when you're 15 years down the line working in media, you know, we can all pat you on the back as legends. Some yeah, nice. Lines. I'll go with that one. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I think, like, lastly, last thing I think for, for, for the teams, for the players, I think you have to expect criticism. I think far too many players and people that are involved in the game nowadays is almost like, oh, you, you shouldn't say that about me. I 100% agree. If it's personal, it's over the line. It's too far. But if we're talking tactics and the way you, your game is and whatnot and about the 90 minutes, you're an open book. You should be sitting there and going, you know what? If I can take anything out of it, great. If I don't agree with it, close yeah. the book, move on. Don't take these things personal. Expect it, especially in a tournament. When you're in that bubble, expect the criticism that's going to come. And use it as fuel. Yeah, I, I do think sort of like sort of to hop back on to where we were playing, but I do think some of the some of the stuff was was below the belt. Like oh, like God, some yeah. of the some of the things were were nasty. Oh, was I remember personally going through a lot a lot. My mum stopped buying the newspapers. Yeah, like, what what what's uh, like caricatures and things like yeah, that? Even do you like, know what I mean? just yeah. complete mick taking. You know, like schoolboy stuff. You know, but like it affects you. It becomes a thing. You know, and like I think it was it was definitely an issue for me. I I I. I 
I struggled. In what way? What time. do you mean? Uh, well, I went from playing, you know, for Southampton, and as soon as you get in the England squad, like things are um, are heightened. Obviously, then I went to Liverpool. And I went for a spell of not scoring goals, which was well documented, uh, and now I just became a figure of fun, like instantly. Right. And then, uh, yeah, and obviously you got to remember my mum and dad are in the crowd, and um, I remember coming on at Old Trafford and getting booed by my by the own, my own fans, and um, it was probably a little bit of that between. Liverpool, Man United, like that kind of rivalry, but that was obviously crept into the stands. So my mum and dad and sister in the crowd, and the whole England, the whole stand, and the whole the whole stadium are, are booing me because of you know maybe a little campaign sort of against me mm. to not be in England squad. So like, like let's be honest, right? I'm I'm a 24 year old kid, right? I'm getting booed by my own fans, mm. and I'm thinking about my mum as I'm coming on to play for England. Were you? Yeah, I'm, that was the first she, start. Well, she's, she's in tears, mm. you know, and I know she, I knew she knew it was upset her, and she didn't come to an England game for the next five, six times. Um, but these are all things that sort of going on behind behind the scenes. But for me personally, obviously, I don't show any weakness. I'm like, yeah. I come on the pitch and I do as well as I can, and I don't show, I don't say to any of the lads like. It wasn't a game you scored an asterisk against Jamaica. No, was it? it wasn't. I wish <laughs> it was, but uh, but like I say, like that, I had to sort of deal with that, and then. I, I'm obviously really proud of myself for, for sort of coming back from that and then and then showing those people like you know coming through at Liverpool, Scott started to score again and then mm. staying in the England squad and playing at two World Cups after that. You know, like that for me is a, is a great sense of achievement. Well, yeah. there's that famous story that Jack Charlton, when he was first picked for England, he went to Alf Ramsey and said to him, like, why have you picked me? And Jack and Alf Ramsey said, I don't pick the best players, I pick the right players. Mm. So what would you describe mm. are the right characteristics then for the right England players to to succeed? Personality. Personality above. And what I mean by that, I mean a player who's going to go and demand the ball, demand to be put on the spot, on the spotlight. You know, it could be a centre-half, whether he's the one in the last five minutes who, who you know when that ball's going to come in, he's going to put his face in the play, right area and get the ball. It's going to be a midfielder. When, when we're losing 2-0 against Germany, who's going to come on, demand the ball when Wembley's turning. You know, it's a centre forward you know when he goes through one-on-one, -on -one, he's going to he's going to choose the right thing. The players who've got the personality above the ability and then you need to look at the the players who've, who've, who've done that, you know, mm. consistently, you know. On that subject though, do you think that... Um, what what you're touching on there is the right it's the right player for that particular game or uh, that particular personality. But do you think that you know all the players that we had, it, maybe it might not fit the right system. Oh, but yeah. All those players would just fit in because they're mm. such good players. You know, do you think we could have perhaps dropped one of those sort of Galacticos, if mm. you like, in the Premier League and played an Owen Hargreaves? Yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, or, we could have done. Or, or dropped one of the forwards, or you know, do you know what I mean? Like we yeah. we felt I felt like, and it was a it was a situation that was levelled at us quite a lot. Yeah, we're just putting all the best players together yes. and going mm. crack yeah. on. Yeah, that, that definitely happened, but I, but I, I do think that, and and you could have affected that by playing a different. You you could have appeased that by playing a different shape. Yeah. Yeah, if exactly. we had a diamond in midfield or yeah. created a free to create overloads in midfield, you, you might have worked. But I totally agree with you. I don't think the managers were strong enough at the time to go, right, hold on, Bex, you've got to sit on the bench. To draw or Stevie or, yeah. or Frank, go on, you've got to sit on the bench. It just yeah. was almost like, I can't do that. I, I remember, and, mm. sorry, but I was talking about that. I remember my when I first started playing, we played Northern Ireland and uh, it was away. at home. Oh. We, won, we were nil, it was nil nil leading up to the game and I was playing really well. And we, but it was Beck, Stevie, Frank, and me in the midfield. I spoke to Kieran Dyer after the game, and it was after after I think I think I scored the the opening goal after three or four minutes, and Kieran and I. But I was playing well. Do you know you know when you know mm. you're playing well. And I was it was coming, but uh, Kieran said to me, Sven said to me, go and warm up. Are you coming on for Joe? Do you know what I mean? But that would that was Sven's mindset. I can't take even though Joe's outperforming mm. them in this game. I can't take mm. them off. And Joe's looking like he's going to open mm. up. In the end, I scored the goal. We went on to win the game, three or four, one. And Kieran sat down. But I wouldn't have known that Kieran come up to me and said to me, like, you was coming off, you know. Do you mm. know what I mean? I was like, Fuck. So, like, that's the pressure probably. Mm. But that's you're what we were about. Like, yeah. We felt that we had to work, like, Extra I have hard. to score in every single game yeah. because I know that if I don't, I'm not coming back. <laughs> there was a loyalty to... to. I think to go back to your one, the question about what a player needs yeah. um, when you're playing for England. I think the, the ability to, to forget mistakes quickly yeah. at that level. Yeah. 
there, there can be I've seen top players come through into the England squad or players that are terrorising the Premier League at a, a certain point in their career and they get to the England squad even just in training forget the game and they make mm. a mistake and they do not recover and you think hold on that's the difference mm. it's, it's there up there get that right in terms of okay if I make a mistake erase it as quickly as possible and don't let it have a hangover and you move on and you can build your performance off the strength of something mm. like that and far too many have that hangover very good mm. listen gentlemen thank you so much for that conversation great to reminisce cool. great to reflect and yeah. I hope there's something in there that people will hear and it will inform them about how to deal with the modern generation of England players and who knows what will happen in the next few weeks eh? and if they don't win it we'll cane them <laughs> <laughs> Just a quick one to say thank you so much for watching this content on the High Performance channel. We would love it if you would subscribe. You know, most people that watch what we do don't subscribe. If you can subscribe, we can make this bigger, better, bolder than we've ever done before. So hit subscribe right now and help the High Performance podcast make a real difference to the world. See you soon.